Welcome everyone to this event. Thank you all for coming. I just wanted to briefly uh, introduce our moderator and panelists today. Um, I'm very grateful actually that this panel is being moderated by Hillary Chute. Hillary is I think one of the uh, uh, clearest and most intelligent voices writing about and advocating on behalf of comics within the academic world. Uh, she's the author of two books. Uh, the first is Graphic Women, and the most recent is Outside the Box, which is a collection of her interviews. Uh, it's for sale upstairs at the Rebus Books table. Uh, and uh, she is also the, and I always have to read this because I always get this name wrong, you know it by heart, the Neubauer Family Assistant, assistant Professor of English at the <laughs> University of Chicago. And I can't think of anyone more appropriate to be moderating this panel. She has worked many times uh, with our panelist, uh, Alison Bechdel, who many of you know, of course, as the creator of the comic strip Dykes to Watch Out For, and the author of Fun Home and Are You My Mother. Uh, and Hiller, and um, <clears throat> Alison herself uh, was inspired in her own work by our other panelist, Howard Cruz. Uh, and Howard's work uh, emerged really from the late period of the underground comics movement. Uh, he was the editor of the anthology Gay Comics, uh, the author of the comic strip Wendell, and the graphic novel uh, Stuck Rubber Baby. Uh, so please join me in welcoming them all here today. We are going to start with some slides, and Allison, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, hello. Hi. Thanks for coming. I'm just going to, I put these slides together to show sort of my relationship to Howard, uh, creative and personal, the evolution of our, uh, wait, hang on, stand by. Um, okay. Oh, why isn't this playing? Oh, shoot. Now something weird is, I thought we were all set. And it's not going. Well, oh, I know why. Here. I knew that was going too smoothly. OK. <laughs> this is some of Howard's early underground work, a Barefoot's panel. Um, and I was not aware of Howard's underground work. I was like still in high school, I think, when you were doing this. Um, but I'm sort of doing a little historical picture here. Here's another of his underground comics. I love this one. This is the, what's the title of this piece? It's about? Uh, it, uh, it's uh, my first acid trip. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I should let you, you talk about your career. Like, how did you go from that to gay comics? Well, it was kind of natural uh, uh, progression for, since underground comics, the extent was to try to um, get through the bullshit of life and be real about life and part of my reality was that I was gay and I uh, you know I'd always expected to that eventually I was going to come out professionally and do put gay content in my work and it but I sort of wanted to uh, I wanted to have a backlog of comics in general to sort of help hope you know keep me from being viewed as strictly a one issue cartoonist but eventually, uh, Dennis Kitchen asked me if I would edit a series uh, called Underground, I mean, called Gay Comics. And uh, because he and I had conversations, he knew I was gay. And so uh, I said, um, this was a good time to do that because it was, good, it was a good opportunity to be affirmative, to do something affirmative coming out rather than to have anything that had any flavor of the confessional in it. And. Um, so anyway, they, we came up with, with gay comics, and part of our agenda was to give a platform for gay and lesbian uh, cartoonists to, uh, who might have hesitated and f felt that they didn't have an outlet to have a place that they could be you know, honest about their lives in. You know, it's interesting that you felt like you had to establish yourself as a l legitimate cartoonist first, because that's something I didn't have to think about, precisely because you did it. You like paved the way with this book. I graduated from college in 1980. I went, I came to New York. I went to the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop and I found this on the, on the magazine rack. And here were all these comics about 
gay people living their lives. And I was like, oh, I, I can write comics about being a lesbian. And then I went on to do that. Didn't have to even worry about it. Howard, can I ask you quickly, um, what did you feel like was the relationship of gay comics and your vision for it um, to other sort of identity-based underground comics, like some of the women's comics titles, or even you know Mary Wings's Come Out comics, or well, you know other gay comics. The wi women's comics in general were an inspiration in terms of getting past the kind of testosterone-oriented uh, male comics, um, both you know superhero type and also in the underground there was a lot of sort of male strutting going on, and, uh, the, but the women were doing stuff that was really uh, uh, soulful. And uh, then I was inspired uh, when Mary Wings and Roberta Gregory, uh, Mary Wings with Come Out Comics and Dyke Shorts and Roberta Gregory with Dynamite Damsels, um, their work was just, you know, the kind of thing I thought was a really good, uh, a good way for the gay experience to be put, put on paper in an accessible way. And uh, when Dennis asked me to do gay comics, uh, not only did I were their comics a role model for the kind of stuff I would like to see in gay comics, um, but also those particular women I was able to recruit to be in the issue from the first because I wanted to be sure that gay comics was a co-gender project, that it was not male-dominated. There had been a previous uh, gay underground series called Gay Heartthrobs. Uh, and uh, you know, in its way, it was courageous, but it also was not ambitious in terms of being real life oriented. And it tended to be campy or sexy uh, and all male. Yeah, I was a little daunted by this cover, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I persevered. I persevered and I opened it up and I found your wonderful editorial inside, you know, yeah, that's actually the first gay-themed cartoon of mine that was ever published, uh, and that was published in a, a really fringe publication in an academic magazine that a friend of mine edited called the Homosexual Counseling Journal that nobody would see uh, in, in my world, and because I was very afraid that it, this direction was going to hurt my career, and it, it took me taking baby steps and seeing if, okay, did that destroy my career? And then I did my first gay theme story <laughs> in, in Barefoot's Funnies number two, you know, but even that didn't say I was gay, it just said the character was gay and see if that destroys my career. And, but you know, any, anybody who's gay, who's been through the experience of coming out, at least anybody who came out during the era when um, it was really a scary, really scary thing to do, uh, knows that the coming out process tends to be in a series of steps rather than suddenly blasting it out to the world. And Howard, what was the response when this came out in 1980? How would you um, describe well, how it landed? Well, it was a big hit in the gay bookstores. It was not, uh, most of the regular comic shops uh, didn't carry it. Uh, but there, in those days, there was a big network of gay bookstores, just like there were big networks of women's bookstores. And some of the women's bookstores would carry it because there was a lesbian presence in it, and they, that made it feel at home to them. So, I mean, it was actually enough of a hit. We did the first issue. At, thinking it might be a one-shot. and But that got such a good reaction that then Dennis said, let's do more. I just was really moved by the inclusive tone of this editorial and how you talked about wanting to you know, draw about our real lives. Uh, that was very moving to me. And then you had this amazing piece in it, Billy Goes Out. Here's a short, a short passage of it. Can people see the screen okay? Yeah. Do you want to talk about Billy Goes Out? Well, as, as many of you may have heard who are too young to have experienced it. The uh, late 70s were a wild time sexually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to put it one way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Billy goes out, I was trying to show that the fact that one might have a very sexually adventurous life uh, did not mean that one was a one-dimensional, you know, sexual obsessed person. Most people it was something they might do, recreational sex was something they would do, but they also had lives and were, you know, fully broad uh, people. And so in that story, you have the bottom half of each panel is what Billy does when he goes out to the, you know, the gay clubs, the sex clubs of New York City in uh, the late 70s. And meanwhile, you have the flow of 
stream of consciousness things that's going through his head that's about everything from his relationships uh, to, uh, uh, you know, his little uh, rejection checklist for all the things that would be why he wouldn't think of this person or that person as a good prospect for a long-term relationship. It was just a wonderful, rich uh, story. Uh, and, you know, when I look at your early work, I just, it's, it's amazing to me how, how much I ripped off from you, you know? <laughs> Can I you mean, be more specific? Well, I, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I, okay. I mean, so I, I discovered gay comics, I discovered Howard's work and the work of many other gay and lesbian cartoonists, and I was like 21, 22, and I started doing my own comics. Um, this was my very, very first one ever published. Twyla is appalled to learn that Irene is a morning person. <laughs> Wait, but Allison, can I pause you for a second? Yes. Will you explain how this got published? Yes, I was just about to do okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> this was um, published in a feminist monthly here in New York called Woman News, and I was actually on the collective of the paper, so I sort of like, I guess it's a kind of self-publishing. Um, but this was a... I, I thought, too, this would be a one-shot thing, but people really liked it, and so I started doing a comic every week for the newspaper, and eventually that turned into... Um, a, a strip, a multi-panel strip, but I never, when I was starting out, I didn't write about recurring characters because I didn't know how to draw the same characters more than once. <laughs> uh, and then I, start, I discovered Wendell. Howard started working on his amazing, long-running, sort of soap opera drama, Wendell, in The Advocate. And do you want, you want to talk about the history of Wendell? Well, Wendell, um, The Advocate, um, I mean, nowadays it's scarcely a magazine at all. It's sort of a web presence. But when it started, it was a tabloid newspaper for, the, you know, for gay people. And um, I would look at those big pages and think, oh, that would be, just, be so great to have a full-page comic strip using all that space. There would be so much room to develop things. And... Uh, they had this section called the pink pages that you didn't get if you got the magazine on the newsstand because it was really, it was hardcore sex ads and stuff like that. But uh, the idea was, uh, you know, I would do humorous stuff about the uh, sexual subculture uh, using this sort of innocent perspective, which I thought, personally, I, I felt kind of a mission to indicate that to be sexual is not to be non-innocent. Um, and uh, so it started off, I was thinking it was going to be a sex strip, just a riff on cruising and all of that. But by the time I'd gotten a few strips in, the uh, AIDS epidemic had started to arise, and it became more complicated to be humorous about the cruising one-night stand lifestyle. And uh, also, so I, I began thinking, well, maybe if Wendell gets in a relationship and... Uh, and then I thought, well, gee whiz, that actually would allow me to go into some really un unexplored territory in gay comic strips. Because there had been lots of, there had been a number of sex oriented uh, comic strips in gay magazines, but uh, uh, there hadn't very much about relationships. And I was, had a relatively new relationship then. I think Eddie and I had been together for four years then. And there's, there's a lot of little aspects to trying to... And you're still together. And we are still together. <laughs> um, we hit our 35th uh, <laughs> this month. <Amazing>. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, you know, melding your life with another person when you're both adults, you know, that's a complicated process, but an interesting one, and one you could have fun with. And so that's how, you know, Wendell developed into what became a regular feature. How did you start publishing it in The Advocate? Well, I, um, they re the first, um, first gay strip that I did uh, that was not in an underground comic was for The Village Voice. I was asked to do a strip about, um, in, re in re reaction to this very homophobic, this anti-gay movement that was going on in the early days of the uh, Reagan administration. And so I did a strip called Sometimes I Get So Mad that was just about all of the emotions and complicated feelings you have when you're under attack, uh, you know, from everywhere. And uh, the advocate saw it and asked to reprint it. So then they knew who I was. 
So then I told them how great a comic strip would look filling up their pages. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and they said, well, well, do a proposal. So at first I thought I would do a comic strip. There's this, uh, in the third issue of Gay Comics, there's a sort of older gay couple. Uh, the story is named uh, Dirty Old Lovers, you know, long-term gay couple. Uh, they're they're very, very amusing characters. Uh, and I said, why don't we, I do a regular comic strip about them because they were great to write for. Uh, but they said, you know, being uh, ageist as everyone seemed to be in the gay community, they said, well, couldn't you do something about a young gay person? <laughs> and uh, so I created Wendell, but then after I'd done Wendell for several years, I folded the Dirty Old Lovers into Wendell, yeah. and they became, and one of them was Wendell's uncle. And so I got to do my comic strips about Dirty Old Lovers uh, after all. So I, w I didn't see a lot of the early Wendells because they were in the pink pages where I did not right. usually venture. But in, I think, 85, you published a, a collection of them. And that's when I really discovered Wendell and started reading it and was amazed at this you know, cartoon universe he had created with these recurring characters that he drew over and over again exactly the same. And <laughs> <laughs> but in that, in that strip you showed earlier, the you had the same woman showed up in several panels. Well, yeah, I guess I, I was just sort of fudging it. But to, to sustain that over multiple episodes, I, that really, I, that was so daunting. But I saw Howard doing it, and eventually I was emboldened to, to try it myself. Here's a close-up of one of his panels of Wendell and his partner, Ollie. You should make, make sure you go to Howard's table because you can see his work. He has some of his originals there and they're gorgeous. They're huge, huge, beautiful drawings, all drawn with rapidographs. Like over, he makes these thick lines with single little rapidograph strokes over and over. Um, <laughs> who did that cover? Do you know? I, 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 that, uh, I forget who it is, but obviously they were parodying the uh, Keen drawings that were <laughs> popular in those days. Well, this was, uh, eventually I submitted a piece to Gay Comics. This was many years later, five, six, seven years later. And I was so psyched because my piece, The Crush, was ran right after Howard's piece. And so we were like touching in the... <laughs> <laughs> and I was really excited uh, when I saw Allison's work. She began to be in Gay Comics after my editorship had ended. Someone else was doing it. Uh, Robert Tripto was editing it then. Oh, right. And uh, I uh, was so excited because of the combination of her real sense of humor and her cartooning skills, which were so professional and oh, polished. Well, they really weren't, Howard. You're being oh. very kind. I, they, I was so bad at, 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 but, uh, early but on. There's a whole issue of gay comics that's dedicated to Allison's work. Eventually, yeah. That was so. after later than this. But well, I'm, I mean, I see everything that's wrong. That I see everything that's wrong with my early stuff too, Allison. But that's a that's beautiful cartooning. Well, I I, I learned a lot from Howard. Oh, here's a close-up of, of his piece in that. This was about. What was the idea here? It was a takeoff <laughs> on Man in the Street interviews. It happened, at, I think at the time, it was the 25th anniversary of Stonewall. And so it was a television crew sort of, you know, hijacking people on the street and asking them to, you know, talk about the gay world. And of course, anytime someone comes at you with a microphone, there's a tendency to set, you go totally wild, feeling smarter than you really <laughs> are. And so I have this version of myself who just goes, crazy with predictions about how things are going to be, you know, for gays in the future. And so that's what that was. It was called The Gay in the Street. All right. Howard, why did you pass on the editorship to Robert Tripto? Well, frankly, because I started doing Wendell and it was too much to try mm -hmm. to do both. You, was Wendell weekly? Bi-weekly. Yeah. But each time, I mean, there was a lot of panels. There were big comic strips yeah, and even yeah. later on when the magazine changed format, it was two-page spread. Um, so it was, there was a lot of drawing for that, so. Yeah. Um, so I did eventually get, get up the nerve to write, start writing about recurring characters, very inspired and influenced by, by Howard's work, and I started writing Dykes to Watch Out for. And here's, this is a letter that I sent to Howard. <laughs> Will you read some of it in your well, own voice? Okay. I, <laughs> mostly I was... I, I, I had been admiring his work for years, but I needed his advice. I was going to go on a book tour with my second book, and I had heard that Howard did a slide presentation 
with his, when he toured with the Wendell books. I was asking him how he did that. But I was also writing him a fan letter, and I said, um, this is the key thing for me. I guess more than anything else, I want to thank you for being so technically accomplished and still not compromising your politics. It's a very rare balance, and it's helped me a lot to see someone actually achieve it in my field. And by that, I meant that you were out. You were just doing this out queer stuff, and it was really good. You could have been not doing that, you know? So that was very inspiring to me. And Howard wrote back on his beautiful letterhead. <laughs> I'm exhilarated that you wrote. This is one of the best letters I ever got. So he, I was so psyched that he like, knew about my work and everything. That was wonderful. And then he invited me to come visit him in New York, and he, we talked about slideshows and stuff. <laughs> and that's when we met. We first met in 1988. But you have always been so immensely generous. As have you, you wrote introductions to two of my books. I mentioned. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Here is our first collaboration. This was, I was really excited about this. Um, it was for something in the Village Voice. Yeah, the Village Voice, once again, I think it was something to do with an anniversary of the Stonewall. And so it was the different phases of the gay movement. And we alternated characters, people representing different phases, you know, from the early guys in suits, you know, trying to be respectable in the homophile movement before Stonewall, and, you know, then you go through the hippie thing, and uh, the uh, Christopher Street clone thing, and, and meanwhile she did the female uh, variations on, on the lesbian. It was, it was really, again, daunting, I keep using this word, but to, to do this piece with you, because I really had to up my game. I, I, my drawings were so weak next to yours. I had to, I, it, you made me start thinking about using thicker outlines. And I don't know, I just had to really tighten up my, my drawing a lot. But those, those aren't too bad. It worked. Yeah, there's like... The it's early, always early interesting 60s. to see, you know, to see jams where cartoonists with different styles, their images are together, you know. Yeah. Like Robert Crumb and Ellen Kaminsky do. Nobody could be so too more different than those two are. But I think the... The strips, the dirty laundry strips oh that they God. do together are more fun, uh, really, than uh, anything That's that like the uh, Crumb has done individually in years. Yeah, yeah. And then Howard began working on his masterpiece, Stuck Rubber Baby. And I, I got to, you know, I heard about this over the years. How many years did it take you? Four years. Four years uh, of intense labor on this book. Um, it was exciting to hear about this process. P people weren't really, graphic novels hadn't really become like the huge trend that they are now. And he was out on his own drawing this massive project. So Howard, um, what made you decide to embark on a graphic novel project? Well, <clears throat> I had ended the Wendell series in 1989. And so the question was in my mind, so now, now what? And uh, it's always been a, it's a natural thing for any cartoonist who does works in the comics field to at least wonder what would I do if I did a graphic novel. And I, in the back of my mind, some themes and things had been stirring, but it seemed totally impossible because of the time it would take and how would I support myself. Um, and then I got this unusual opportunity uh, from DC Comics, who actually was willing to pay a significant advance. Um, and... Uh, so I, so I, I uh, finally, they asked what kind of thing I would like to do, and I thought about it a lot and came up with the basic, you know, premise of Stuck Rubber Baby. Um, it, it was like, uh, it was, I say it was like, you know, climbing the mountain. It's the sort of thing that you do because can you do it? Right. It's not necessarily something you want to do over and over and over again. <laughs> would you describe the premise for the few people who may not have read the book. Well, I grew up in Birmingham and uh, during the civil rights explosions of the uh, 19, early 60s. And I also had this uh, experience of being a, a guy who was very uncomfortable with being gay and who essentially was trying to convince himself that if he worked hard enough at it, he could not be gay. And in the course of doing that, I developed this relationship, uh, which was a very loving relationship. Uh, it was not a phony relationship. Uh, with a girl, uh, 
uh, who was, uh, you know, also in college with me, and uh, so I, we we got real lovey-dovey and seemed that we conceived a baby, and um, so then there was a question of what do you do about that? And I mean, fortunately, from my point of view, she did not want to have an abortion, um, which I was real glad because I, I felt it was her decision. Um, but I was real glad because I thought she's a really great person. Incidentally, we remain friends. Um, she's a great person, and I thought that it would be a very interesting baby. And um, <laughs> and so so I was you know so we did what the character in Stuck Over Baby does. We gave the baby up uh, for adoption. Um, in the book, it says this is the last time that Tola never saw the baby. But in reality, uh, we when our daughter. Reached, became of age, she tracked down her mother and me, and we all had reunions, and we've been in each other's lives ever since, and I'm a grandfather twice. <laughs> um, but, um, but anyway, folding in all of this, the, that experience which happened during the civil rights era for, to me personally, and you know, the, the, the strains of, the, of the, the, the black, the racism issues of the time, and my belief as an Alabamian, that one of the core problems of the South in that era, and I would maintain it, it remains a core problem of America today, is dishonesty. Uh, we will not admit that racism is a problem. Uh, we'll sort of give lip service to that, but people will, it's always somebody else. Somebody else is racist. And uh, all of these strains are, you know, it's not that we're bad people, but they're really encouraged to be embedded in us. And this has things to do with being closeted and being dishonest with your friends. And Tolan's efforts to be truthful, to learn to you know, put himself out there and be truthful was like uh, the fact that Alabama was forced kicking and screaming uh, to acknowledge uh, the role that racism was built in, the way racism was built into Southern culture in those days. And so it, it actually was a unifying, a unifying theme uh, of those different strains. Uh, and it just felt natural for me. And I'd, it was very formative to me to be in Birmingham during that period. And I'd always thought I should do a work of art about it sometime, but I never had a broad enough canvas. The Wendell series didn't have, everything was chopped up into little episodes. And, and uh, so when I had the opportunity to do a graphic novel, I think, well, now I can let scenes spin out at their natural length rather than having to have them come in two-page chunks. And um, so that, that was a great opportunity. It's an amazing mix too of f fiction and fact. Like it's not autobiographical. It's a, li a little bit autobiographical, but uh, much of it is dramatized, fictionalized, and it, it enables you to, to tell this powerful dramatic story, but with a really finely grained detail that comes from your real mm -hmm. experience. And how much uh, autobiography is there in your stuff, Alison? <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember being on a panel with you while you were working on this, and I was just starting to think about telling my story, Fun Home, this book about my, my dad, my closeted gay father who probably committed suicide. Um, and I knew I, that story, I had to tell my story as autobiography. I couldn't fictionalize it. But we had an interesting conversation at a an outright panel about the difference between uh, disguising stories and telling telling them straight up. But uh, oh, this is a, just a close up of your amazing uh, your cross hatching. But Alison, can I pause you there for a second and yes. ask sort of you the same question? At what? How did you decide that you wanted to do this book length graphic memoir? What was the context? Well. I had for a long time wanted to tell the story about my dad. You know, it's a much, it's a smaller, more personal story than the, the, the civil rights movement, but it felt equally as urgent, I think. It felt like just a really important story to look at the way my, I had grown up as a lesbian in the small town. My father had grown up as a closeted gay man or bisexual. Uh, in this small town, we, and he killed himself, and I came out and had this, you know, had this life as a professional queer, and it just was so striking to me the different way, ways that our stories, that our lives turned out that I wanted to 
write about it, but I, I couldn't write about it for a long time because it was a secret. No one knew my dad was gay. No one knew he had killed himself. Um, so I kind of just tabled it for many, many years. And then honestly, it was, it was when people, when graphic novels started getting published, my, my publisher, Nancy Biriano at Firebrand Books said, Allison, you gotta do a graphic novel. This is like the next big thing, you gotta do one. Yeah. <laughs> and she, you know, she didn't care what it was about, but I started thinking, oh, well, uh, maybe, maybe this story about my dad is, is, I could do that as a graphic novel. And so that's, she, Firebrand eventually folded, and so that didn't happen, but um, I started working on the, the story, and it took me a lot longer uh, than four years. It took me seven years. But and for I, most of that time, you were doing Dykes to Watch Out yeah. for at the same time. Yeah, I was doing both both at once. Um, so then I I wrote Fun Home. That came out in 2006. There's a panel from it. Um, so I copied Howard by doing a graphic novel after he did, <laughs> <laughs> writing, a, writing a soap opera-style comic strip after he did. And also, <laughs> I, I feel like just my, my political... Veltan Shaowung has been shaped so much by your politics. Like, my, my comic strip was always very, I was always talking about current events like you did. It was very leftist. I tended to be a little didactic. I wanted to preach to people. I wanted to get people to understand my, my way of, my particular leftist perspective. And I think I got a lot of that from you. Well, you, you created the character of Mo, who is, it's in her personality to, you know, have that kind of didacticism to some extent. But you also treated her humanely, you know. I mean, it, it was, it was. She was not. Um, wor the didacticism was not uh, worshipped. It was in some way satirized. Uh, it was. Uh, yeah. You know, had an ironic uh, angle to the fact that you know those of us who get on soapboxes, you know, there's a certain absurdity about. You know, feeling like you have, you should tell the rest of the world how to be, and uh, at the same time, if you have actual beliefs, it is a good thing to try and communicate them. So, this duality, you know, is sort of built into your character of Mo. You know, once I I got in a relationship with someone who knew me through my work, like before, like she saw my work, and then we got together, and at one point we were having a fight. I was ranting about something. And she said, you sound just like Mo. You sound just like your <laughs> character. And I said, well, I kind of, kind of am Mo. And she, said, and she said, I thought Mo was a joke. <laughs> Ouch. That was the end of that. That didn't last too much longer after that. <laughs> Is this all my slides? Yeah, then here's my big collection of dikes, and that's all, that's all the slides we have. Well, let me um, pick up on something, Allison, that you've talked to me and you've mentioned a little bit already about how you were influenced by Howard's work. So it's funny that the Village Voice keeps coming up because that's how I met Allison, oh, actually. Yeah. Um, I met her to write a story about her in the Village Voice in 2006, and that's when I first talked to Howard because I called him up on the phone to interview him for the story I was writing about Allison in the voice, but I remember when I met you that day, um, the first time I met you, you were describing just that moment of seeing the first issue of Gay Comics in the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop, and you talked about the everydayness of the work, like you could do real strips about your everyday life as a gay person. So I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit more um, in both of your work. Um, the sense of dailiness or ordinariness yeah, that, well that combines with the political and the didactic and everything else. I, I feel like that's the mission you were describing in that first issue. It was like we are three-dimensional people with full lives. We're not just sexual beings. And I guess that's, that's another thing that I, I copied from you was I, I was always working really hard to show sex, to show my characters naked and in sexual situations, but to somehow to make it not erotic <laughs> or to demystify it, you know, just to do it very openly um, as, as an everyday part of life. So that was a, a big influence. Well, you know, in the days of the real anti-gay backlash 
uh, in, in the 80s that was uh, encouraged uh, by the Reagan administration and the, by the what was then called the moral majority. We had these prominent people like Jerry Falwell who were, and Jesse Helms was a senator who was just vituperously homophobic uh, on the floor of the Senate. Uh, there was this concept called the gay agenda, uh, which essentially these mysterious people out there, <laughs> but you know, they are plotting together to you know, undermine uh, the family and to undermine American values and stuff like that. And that's, um, you know, and so part of my mission was to sort of portray the way it really was, which was, I mean, there was no unified, you know, gay agenda other than we want the right to be ourselves. Uh, but given that right, we're not trying to take over the world, you know, and we would like to not be persecuted, please. And, um, <laughs> You know, and but meanwhile, Wendell, the Wendell characters are political. I mean, they go to demonstrations, you know, and they are, are, are involved politically, and this, as were my friends. But that does not mean you don't have an everyday life. And there's comedy in both aspects of those, and I, you know, tried to fold them together uh, amusingly. And you did. <laughs> so, Howard, I also wanted to ask you about some of your influences. We've been talking a lot about how Allison has been influenced by you, um, but by whom were you influenced? Well, I had no role models uh, in terms of openly gay uh, mainstream cartoonists uh, other than um, I mean, when I was growing up. I mean, obviously, eventually, there was Roberta Gregory and Mary Wings and people like that, but, but when I was growing up, they, it didn't exist during my teen years when I was realizing I was gay. and. Uh, but one person who was an important role model for me was uh, Allen Ginsberg, uh, because he was someone who was open to gay and who demonstrated that that did not mean you would automatically uh, be beaten to death or that you would be shunned by mainstream society. And in fact, Allen Ginsberg was, I mean, obviously there are certain people who would never like a beatnik, uh, no matter what, but uh, aside from that, uh, that set of people, uh, Allen Ginsberg was uh, celebrated as an important uh, poet. And, and then eventually, as the 50s and 60s moved on, there were more people uh, who were willing to say they were gay, like Truman Capote, Tennessee Williams. Uh, each time somebody who was famous and successful uh, would also say they were gay, it was heartening mm -hmm. to me. I mean, among cartoonists, in terms of the cartooning craft, I mean, any number, I went through any number of phases of imitating this one and that one, everyone from Crockett Johnson to Al Cap to, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't begin to list the number that I studied. How um, did you get involved in underground comics? Well, they kind of rose to the surface uh, during the late 60s at a time when I had just quit thinking of myself as having anything to do with comics because I was not interested in superheroes. And during this period, essentially all humor comics disappeared. I mean, unless you count Archie. Um, and um, so there was, uh, you know, uh, what I was interested in, I, I was influenced by the co Dell comics uh, of the early 50s and uh, great humorous series like uh, uh, Little Lulu, which everyone who knows me knows that that was a big influence, and uh, Uncle Scrooge comics. and. Um, those are the standouts that are, you know, everyone understands what a major achievements they were. But there were, in general, there were a lot of places where you could be funny in comics, and that's what I wanted to do. But then that all disappeared. Uh, uh, and then that happened about the same time that I went to college and uh, found myself in the sway of a charismatic, extremely talented theater director. And so I began. I got involved in the theater and quit paying attention to comics during the superhero era, and we were just doing plays. But I learned, you know, and I wrote plays and directed plays, and eventually I realized that the skills that were involved in writing and directing plays were very much pertinent to the experience of creating comics. In both cases, they're uh, dialogue-driven um, media, mm -hmm. and in both cases, it really makes a difference how you stage scenes on what, how you pace them and stuff like that. So I learned a lot from my uh, theater experience. But when underground comics arose, and I suddenly realized, oh, here's a set of people who are doing daring, interesting things about the life I was leading since I was 
you know, sort of a hippie at the time and doing lots of drugs and uh, stuff. <laughs> um, and there was, and that was my world in the comics. And suddenly it became a more attractive notion um, to do comics again. Well, so I'll just ask one more question and then we'll open it up to the audience for Q&A. So um, I've been so fascinated listening to both of you talk about um, how comics was before our current moment um, in which all sorts of comics and graphic novels and graphic memoirs are celebrated. So I'm wondering what your take on the current state of the field is. Well, I mean, I think it's great. I think that, that you know, graphic novels are, and which is a term that's used for everything, fiction or nonfiction, um, I mean, that uh, it deserves its place as a, a rising art form. Um, I sort of regret that uh, at, at the time that Stuck River Baby came out, essentially there was uh, Art Spiegelman, <laughs> and that's it, uh, in terms of the attention that was paid in the mainstream media. So I didn't get any, you know, I didn't get it reviewed by the Times or didn't get on television or any of the things that sort of might have boosted me into this uh, layer of the literati uh, that might have sold more books. But... Um, well, Stuck River Baby was just republished in 2010. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. That uh, doesn't get you reviews, but... It, it, <laughs> I said something the other night to, to Martha Thomas. I said, if only Stuck River Baby had come out just a little later. And she said, that would... you. It, it couldn't have happened. You, you made, you created the possibility for everything that came after. You, you, your book made, made Fun Home possible. Well, I think all of the, I mean, let's face it, the first you had Mouse. Uh, it wasn't the first yeah. graphic novel, but it was the first, uh, first one to gain a lot of mainstream attention. Obviously, before that was uh, Will Eisner had done things that a lot of people were excited by, and uh, most people don't give any credit to Phil Yeh, but he is actually the first person who marketed a book uh, under the, uh, as a graphic novel. Um, and um, then there was this steady, you know, more and more really good books started coming out by a range of artists, and eventually it was something that the, you know, the major establishment uh, reviewing uh, people couldn't uh, keep ignoring. And so you began to have graphic novels regularly uh, reviewed in the newspapers, and that helped a lot of people and encouraged you know, the new waves. And so it was a slow momentum that was built. It's kind of overwhelming what's happening now, looking at this stuff out on the floor. It's, uh, I, would, I would be terrified to become a cartoonist if I were young <laughs> and starting out right now. In fact, that, I mean, cartooning for me was this free play zone. Like, no one was scrutinizing it. That's why I was drawn to comics. It was just, there were, it was like not a big... Um, uh, creative risk. Like, you just did comics, and if no one read them, big deal. Uh, <laughs> but um, now, now the stakes are a lot higher, I think. I mean, you can still do comics for fun, but uh, at the other end, it's gotten very intense. Well, so let's open it out to questions from the audience. Um, yes, in the black. I wonder if you guys could speak to your personal experience with Backlash when it's become kind of fodder for you and pushed you forward and when it's kind of become crippling and both in the sense of when it's coming from the outside world as well as when it's maybe coming from closer to home. I, 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 I think I've benefited, I don't think I, I had a lot of overt backlash. What I learned, and this was the same lesson I learned when I struggled and struggled about coming out to my friends and worried that I would be rejected and everything. And what I learned was that, in general, who, the people in my life who didn't like that I was gay, they sort of quit being in my life. I didn't, you know, they, the people who were good friends, real friends, uh, continued to like me and, and uh, gave me support. And I think that uh, in my comics, you know, um, some people out there, you know, I'm sure hated that there was this uh, gay comics thing happening. Uh, but they didn't write me about it, they just complained among themselves. I remember there was once, Gary, Andy Mangles, who was the third editor of Gay Comics, wrote an important series, I think it was a two-part article uh, for Amazing Heroes magazine uh, called Gays in Comics. Um, and uh, he, 
interviewed a lot of people in, in the industry, but none of the gay people would identify themselves. It was all anonymous except for me. Um, and uh, one who was, to my, my, my impression is that he has yet to come out, but he was a very well-known, you know, Batman artist. Um, and, uh, you know, he was quoted anonymously, but I knew, because I knew Andy, I knew who it was. You know, he was quoted as saying, I don't want to be like Howard Cruz, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, if you call that a backlash, I guess, but it didn't really harm me. I, I don't feel like I really experienced much backlash precisely because I was able to do my work in this kind of sheltered cocoon of the queer subculture where people who weren't, who it would offend weren't ever going to see it. Um, you know, which has its pluses and minuses. Now, w when when Fun Home came out and it did very well and I sort of crossed over, um, I'm, right now Fun Home has been censored in South Carolina, so uh, I'm getting it. You know, I, yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> but it's because you know my work was never reaching anyone for whom it would be a problem. Now, now it's starting to, so it's kind of cool. <laughs> yes, in the back. Um, yeah, this is kind of connected to um, that last question. Uh, I, the high school I went to in the city, Stuyvesant, um, the. My old English teacher there, Miss McMahon, she uh, wanted to teach Fun Home in, in her English class. And first of all, I was just thrilled that she would teach any comic in, in her English class, but like such a, an important and revealing one, it was like a great choice. But um, our uh, princ the principal at the time, uh, Stanley Titel, he wouldn't let her teach it because yeah, I heard about it that. featured uh, lesbian sex. And that seems surprising. Was it sex or lesbian sex that he objected to? I think it was, the, the, it was lesbian. Yeah, because I mean, there's plenty of books that they teach in English classes that has heterosexual. That are graphic. Uh, well, part, part of it is the fact that it's pictures of sex. Yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what I was trying to it get at. So outrageous to me, and um, I, I had a chance to visit uh, high school, and I talked to her about it, and she was so upset about it. And like, I was wondering what you would say to Stanley if you had no chance. Well, I, you know, it, it's, high school is, I don't know what it's like to be a high school principal. I, I don't know what kind of pressures he has to answer to. I can see that you might be a little squeamish about teaching it in high school. But Stuyvesant, I thought I had a little higher expectations of so. <laughs> There's a lot of irrationality uh, about uh, what you can expose children to. I mean. It is obvious, every, every child who is seven years old uh, has heard people say fuck. <laughs> um, but art that has the word fuck in it is considered, oh, that we must not, you know, they must be 18 or over before we ever, you know, let them hear that. It, it, it's so crazy. And Stuck Over Baby, I mean, one of the reviews of Stuck Over Baby when it came out was that this is the book to give a young gay, uh, a young gay teenager. Uh, and, uh, you know, I appreciated that because I do think, you know, the presence of gayness in the world is an important thing for children to know about. And uh, the presence of sex in the world is an important thing, uh, you know, particularly for teenagers uh, because they're feeling it. Um, and they need to have a perspective and a context for those feelings. Um, and, uh, and yet we're such a puritanical country that we're, we're just totally irrational. You were so cool yesterday. This young woman with, was talking to Howard and me and she had her kid with her. He was, I don't know, maybe 10, 11. And he wasn't really paying attention to us. But, and you, but you were talking about the old handkerchief code and, and what the different colored handkerchiefs meant. This one's sadomasochism, this one's golden showers. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> is this kid listening? And he, he was totally bored, but I was, it was so cool. <laughs> Felt like that was an okay conversation. <laughs> well, I, I, there was a, at a certain point, you know, I realized that if you if you get used to being open, you can lose track of what's acceptable. <laughs> and I would do interviews, you know, and somehow we would get off into some subject about you know sexual mores or something, and I would be talking about my experiences, this, that, and the other, and then somewhere in the back of my mind, you know. This is going to be in publication, you know. This is going to be printed. Are you supposed to say that? Or, but I'm an underground cartoonist. I'm allowed to say that, you know. <laughs> you know I, but you know, basically, by then it's all been said, and uh, you know. So I think uh, 
kids in general, if you say something about sexual subcultures and stuff like that, it will mean nothing to them. Just like if you have, if they see a Playboy magazine, um, they will know, oh, these people are undressed. Um, but it's only when they start, you know, their own sexual awakening begins having, happening that it will be related to them. Otherwise, it's just some magazine that Daddy has on, the, you know, that has naked people in it. Yes. Um, I wanted to, uh, one of the things that was amazing about your graphic novel stuff from a baby when it came out and who it came out from. I was wondering if you could speak to how the adjustments you had to make because you had a pretty free will. You seem to have pretty unfettered creative freedom at the time when you were publishing in the get and the app and in the, in the, in the queer community. And then when you transitioned to a so-called more mainstream a publisher, I imagine there were constraints you might have had to deal with that even that to, that you had to manage in an artful way or to, or to, or to change or to help check, send the message over to people who were not who weren't as familiar with the content. And I'm trying to speak to that. Well that's because when Stucker when the contract for Stucker or Baby was signed uh, I mean, DC Comics, the logo was not going to be there. It was published under an imprint called, it was going to be published under an imprint called Piranha Press, which was explicitly set up to be edgy, experimental uh, things that push different boundaries. And, uh, and a guy named uh, Mark Nevelo was the editor then. Uh, then, uh, and when I talked to Mark about doing the book, and he encouraged me to submit a proposal. Uh, you know, I said, well, there's certain ground rules. I mean, you know, not to be a prima donna about it, but I can't work the normal DC way. It's just not the way I create drawings. It's not the way I create pages or scripts or whatever. Um, and I said, for one thing, it would, it would have to be able to have gay content, and including gay sex. I don't mind. It doesn't have to have explicit sex. You don't have to see sex organs. But I mean, it has to be unabashed about having a gay presence in the book. And he said, well, you know what, I would like, that's fine. He said, I would like for it to have a heterosexual presence too. Um, and, uh, you know, and I thought that was legitimate and actually welcome because I had been doing Wendell, which took place pretty much in the gay ghetto. It had some straight characters in it, but it was pretty much a contemporary gay ghetto uh, community, uh, like the one that I experienced living in New York in those days. and. Uh, yeah, I felt I'd done that. Um, this book was going to be set in the early 60s, before Stonewall, before there was a, a gay movement that certainly anybody in Alabama knew about. And, uh, you know, so it would be, and, and I wanted to sort of convince myself that I could write persuasive, uh, straight characters, that I was not somehow, you know, limited in that way. And it just became interesting to try to, to mix those things. So those, he had that request, which I thought was fine. And I had mine about I want to be gay. And I also said I can't, you know, I need to have a level of creative freedom that you're not used to giving uh, people at DC Comics. And I can't, that's what, the way I learned to do comics and underground comics. So I said, look at my past work. See if you think I'm a responsible person with taste, you know. Um, if you have any questions about that, let's don't do this because we'll just get into fights. Um, but if, it, if you feel confident, then, then give me a lot of leeway. And they asked to see a working script before I started drawing, which was uh, nothing I'd ever done for underground comics. Uh, but it was a good thing, because this is a long book, and I could have easily, if I just sort of freewheeled my way through it, I could have gone down some blind alleys and said, oh my god, I've been sitting and going down here six, for six months, and now it's a bad idea. So I was able to create the arc of the story. But I told him, when I do it, I'm going to do like I did in Underground Comics. I'm going to change it as I go along. So, so we came, and they said, fine. Just let's make sure you have some basic architecture, and then you can make changes and develop it. And you know, they were just more than reasonable, and I really appreciated that. Yes. I don't know how 
people get started. And this is a, this is a bummer of an answer, but it seems like, um, I mean, it's always been true that you have to give your work away for free at first to get yourself out there, but it seems to be, <laughs> now you're expected to keep giving your work away for free. <laughs> uh, which is really problematic. I, I, don't, I don't know how, how people get a foothold. I think, I mean, the issue is not about gay. The issue is about how in the world anybody can be a cartoonist these days when nobody pays for anything. Um, and I don't know the answer to that, and I'm glad I'm not starting out now because I'm not sure how, how I would manage to do it. I mean, there is not an infrastructure, an underground comics infrastructure, uh, which even though undergrounds didn't pay well, you know, there was pay and it was not assumed that you were going to work for free. Um, and uh, so I think, frankly, uh, it's rare that anyone would be stopped because of gay content at this point, unless they were trying to get something published in, you know, Bible Belt or something. Um, but it is hard just to be a cartoonist. Yes? Sort of touching, uh, uh, touching on this, uh, your speaking before, and I had it question I wasn't going to ask, but now we've kind of gone there, but you were saying that you were concerned about, um, you were sort of pushing uh, the boundaries of what you thought you could do and not harm your career. So based on what we just said, like before you did stuff up early, uh, did you have like a, a working cartoonist career that was... Is, is that how you were supporting yourself before that? Yes, after, from, I mean, it took me 10 years after I graduated from college to be a full-time cartoonist. And I was able to be a full-time cartoonist because I did humorous illustrations uh, for mainstream magazines. Uh, many of those <coughs> illustrations, you can see the original art for them at my table upstairs. Uh, but uh, that, the fact that those paid professional rates subsidized my underground comics work um, and that allowed me to do that. But now there's so few publications on paper, or, or publications that pay money, or you know, all of those things, that I don't know if that uh, strategy would work anymore. Yes, in the glasses. Um, Howard, I know you were talking a little bit about your process in writing Sorry. Stuff Rubber Baby, and uh, Allison, I know you talked a little bit about your process in Are You My Mother. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about um, what you do to prepare for writing this kind of, you know, these kinds of long form works that are, are so detailed and, you know, weave things together so um, intricately. How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like my, my life is my preparation. I mean, I, I keep records, I save stuff, I look back at my journal entries, I look back over old pictures, a lot of that kind of self-reflection shaped the evolution of, of my memoirs. Uh, and then just research, you know, I love doing research. A lot, uh, a lot of uh, the writing of the work of the uh, working script for Stuck or a Baby was very much like playwriting. Um, and, uh, and then a lot of the part of drawing it, once I had written it, was very much like directing a play. Um, so, you know, I, I drew on those things that they gave me a comfort level at entering into this procedure. Can I ask a quick question here, just jumping in? I just learned today that um, Allison's process, which I find really fascinating, of using photographs um, from which to draw her work was learned from you. Could you just explain that connection? Well, I, when, when I Howard was working on Stucker Baby, he was talking to me about these. First, at first you did actual field trips, like to Birmingham. You were taking pictures of buildings and stuff, like to get these visual references, and also trips to the picture file at the public library. And I was so impressed <laughs> at, at the level of research that you were doing because this was way before Google image search. I mean, now you can do all that stuff easily, but when you were working, you could not. So, Well, I did what I could uh, on the uh, budget that I had, which wasn't much. Uh, I, I would have reasons to go down to Alabama because I had family there and we would, I would go down for Christmas and then I would go around and take pictures of 
everything from the vegetation to houses to things that, I mean, if you ask me to draw a house out of my imagination, I revert to a, a second grader. You know, <laughs> uh, so I really need to have something real to look at. And when I was taking, I took a correspondence course called the Famous Artist Cartooning Course uh, when I was in high school. And, uh, you know, one of the people I was influenced by who was, wrote the textbooks for that was Milton Kniff. You know, and he and other cartoonists talked about it's all very well to simplify. You know, cartooning is simplification and distortion, but you're always on firmer ground if you know what the real thing looks like before you start simplifying it. <laughs> and so I always tried, you know, and, and believe me, I went back uh, to the New York Public Library picture collection uh, the day before yesterday uh, because there's a project I've been stalled on. Uh, for years because of one image I needed and I could not find reference for it online. And in 15 minutes I had what I needed from the picture collection. So if any of you aspiring cartoonists out there, if you live around here and don't use that picture collection, I mean, you're nuts. It's, <laughs> it's a great resource. Um, but I, you know, also there's a great deal of faking. Um, I, uh, I, I learned what I could, I got reference on everything I could. And then everything else, I just hoped people would think. I mean, there were reviewers who said this was an exhaustively researched book, and I had to roll my eyes because I knew all the places that I just had to take a flyer because I didn't know. Fortunately, I draw clothes badly, so nobody can tell if my characters are fashionable or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have time for one more question. Um, let's see. Okay, two more questions. You and you. <laughs> we'll keep it quick. <laughs> Okay. Um, I've actually read both of um, Helen's books, and I read Step Over Baby. I couldn't help but think, question, how cathartic it is to write about your own life, to put it out there so personally, especially with Allison. And is it cathartic, or do you find that it's difficult, or combination? Oh, catharsis is, is difficult. I mean, yeah, it was a cathartic process and it was a difficult one. Um, I used to shy away from that and say, oh no, it wasn't cathartic, it wasn't therapeutic, it's, it's art. <laughs> but I don't really, I don't know why anyone would bother, but I think the urge to create comes out of, you know, pain and loss and something missing and you're always trying to do some kind of repair. So yeah, that's why I did it. Okay, yes. Where can I buy Upstairs. Right upstairs, um, <laughs> close to the front door, is where it is. Go to the comic book. The comic book legal defense fund is actually has all, uh, almost all of my books. Has you know, all but a couple of really obscure ones. Okay, let's have a round of applause for.